I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Sam Newman. Uh, Sam is an independent consultant at Sam Newman and Associates. Uh, he is a, a consultant specializing in helping people ship software faster. He will talk about microservices and architecture. The stage is yours, Sam. Welcome. Thank you so much indeed. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm sorry we can't be doing this in person because CraftConf is basically my favorite conference of the year. So I'm really glad to be able to participate and actually meet people in a way that I've never been able to meet you before. So for those of you who haven't been able to come to a CraftConf before, welcome. This is about my fourth or fifth time, I think. And I love coming to this event every single year in whatever form it happens. Today, we're going to be talking about microservices, which are sort of still a bit of a new concept, but also a lot of old concepts and how they're related to microservices and how maybe paying attention to ideas from the 1960s might help our 2021 based software architectures work a little bit better. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Sam Newman. I do, you know, sort of I work as a consultancy consultant working for my own company. Um, I do training advisory consultancy work. You can find out information about me on the internet. I'm fairly easy to find. Uh, my main focus at the moment has just been finishing off the second edition of my book, Building Microservices, which I literally handed in to the publisher yesterday. So he's got to wait on the copy edit. That will be out in August or something like that. So again, if you want information about that, head over to my website. But we're here to talk about microservices and the lovely, wonderful things that microservices can help us do, and also all of the horrible things that microservices can also cause to make happen. When we think about microservice architecture, or at least when I talk about microservice architecture, the thing I, the, the property of these architectures that I tend to focus on more than any other is this idea of independent deployability. And the reason for that is because if you manage to make independent deployability work, loads of other benefits just flow naturally from this. So independent deployability is the idea that you go in and make a change to a single microservice. You can then deploy that microservice into a production environment and then release that functionality to the wider world. And that's the whole concept behind independent deployability. And this, this opens up opportunities for you know, teams working more in isolation, the, the, you know, reducing the need for coordination around release activities, makes it easier to implement things like zero downtime, de uh, downtime deployments as well. But making independent deployability works, it's a simple concept, but it actually can be quite complex in execution. Now, if I want to make a change, as I just did, to that accounts microservice and I deploy a brand new version of it, one of the concerns we always have in these situations, and this is one of the biggest issues around independent deployability, is how do I make sure that I haven't broken my upstream, uh, an upstream consumer here? So this situation here, the customer service is making use of the functionality that the accounts microservice exposes. So when I change this accounts microservice, what happens to this interaction? If we want independent deployability, that has to be a safe thing. When I deploy that new microservice, I have to be confident that I'm not going to break the upstream consumers. So in this situation here, I want to make sure that I'm not going to break that upstream customer microservice. The way we achieve this really is by trying where possible to make sure that our interfaces are stable. So whatever interface, whatever service API that you've exposed, whatever you know, communication protocol you've picked for your microservice, we want that to have a degree of stability uh, so that when we make a change to our microservice that we're not constantly changing that interface in a way that would make problems for our existing consumers. Fundamentally, what we're talking about here when we mean stability is making backwards compatibility a vital part of our service evolution. If we want independent deployability, it's unsustainable to do that if we constantly break all of the other, the rest of the system around us. Therefore, if you want independent deployability, you need to get good at backwards compatibility. And so this talk in many ways is about exploring well, what are the implications of getting good at backwards compatibility and, and how do we make that happen in, in reality? Because when I want to make a change, I don't want to be breaking anybody. Now, if we go back into the dark mist of time, much of our software was written to run on big computers, mainframes. We used to have a very, very small number of very large machines. Uh, as, our, as these mainframe systems became more powerful, we wrote programs that were more complicated. Uh, those programs that were more complicated became harder to work with. And so you know, people started looking at how do you take a big code base and break that code base down to make it more manageable? 
And this is what led to us thinking about breaking down programs around modules. So although we might be deploying a big giant program onto a big giant single machine, like a, like a mainframe machine, we could still break that program down into these independent modules. These modules would allow for a degree of independent working. You could have different teams owning different modules. These modules also give us the ability to potentially reuse code across different programs. And, uh, you know, this is, this is an incredibly useful concept. I think it's unfortunate if we look at our modern programming languages that on the whole, we're actually quite bad when it comes to thinking about modular boundaries. We tend to, you know, we don't really make use of even the very simple concepts that we have that would theoretically give us something like modular separation, like namespaces and packages, you know, in our code. We tend to think of these as quite loose concepts and maybe they're just sort of arbitrary ways of categorizing code rather than us thinking about actually finding and defining useful boundaries. The closest we actually get in a way to even thinking in terms of modular programming is purely in the concept of somebody else's code, a third party piece of code that I'm reusing. So I'm pulling in somebody else's NPM, their JAR file or their gem. It's very rare that we actually think formally about breaking apart our own programs into modules. Well, I hold that thought because the world changed. Obviously we went from mainframe based computers to well, modern server infrastructure. We now have a large number of, relatively speaking, small machines. And although mainframes still do want a large amount of the world's uh, banking systems, for example, most of us are now developing in this new reality. We have lots and lots of different computers. And what happened with software architecture was the software architecture had to deal with this transition. So effectively what we did was we took those modular architectures that we had running in the mainframes and we kind of just said, well, okay, rather than these modules now running on on you know one big monolithic application what if these modules now just run computers now i think you could absolutely argue that microservices are a form of modular architecture the difference now is that these modules rather than running in the same process in the same runtime now run as separate processes on separate machines and the communication between these modules rather than being the in-process calls that we would expect are now network-oriented interactions, which opens up a wide variety of different choices that we didn't have before. The nice thing about this, of course, is it theoretically allows us for an easier degree of independent deployability because we have separate runtimes and separate ring fence sets of resources. So we've got a lot more options in terms of how we do things like hot swapping of modules. Hot swapping of modules within a single runtime is actually a complicated activity unless you've actually got a runtime built for it, something like the Erlang Bean VM. Or it must be said, most mainframe based systems were quite happy to support hot swapping of modules. Hot swapping of modules on something like the, on, on the JVM, you sort of do the thing like OSGI and it's not a great experience. It's not OSGI's fault, it's just fundamentally the JVM was not built for us to hot swap code inside it. So, but with computers, different computers running different JVMs, for example, if you're a Java programmer, this issue just goes away. I actually kind of the more increasingly have thought about this is that when they're done right, microservices are really a form of modular architecture. And if we think about the concepts of modular programming that were pioneered many, many years ago, we can take alert the learnings from that experience to make our microservice architecture more effective and to better deliver on this property of independent deployability. When I first wrote Building Microservices, I started writing in 2014, and I, I, I can included a reference to information hiding. I remember uh, Martin Farage said, you know, this, there's some, some, some relation here, and I sort of included it as a concept. Now, when I came to write the second edition, the most important concept in many ways in that book is this concept of information hiding. This was this is sort of kind of crystallized in my head over the last five or six years. The concept of information hiding comes from someone called David Parnas. He wrote this paper on the cr criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules back in 1971. And what Parnas was looking at was, well, we've got this modular software, but how do we decide how we draw a module boundary? And what different types of module boundaries are more effective and efficient? And so when looking into this process, what he wanted was, well, if we've got different modules, we've got different people working on different modules, we want to create a situation where people can work independently from one another without constantly having to get in each other's way. And the technique he kind of highlighted as being the most effective and efficient was the idea of information hiding. Inf information hiding in a nutshell is to say your default position almost should be that you hide everything within a module boundary. 
that you don't expose anything unless it's explicitly asked for or explicitly needed. Because anything you expose over a module boundary becomes part of your contract that you're going to have to fulfill going forward. The larger the contract, the larger the API you have to maintain, the harder it is to maintain that in terms of backwards compatibility. And the likely is you're going to end up with cross-cutting changes. On the other hand, something that's hidden inside a module boundary cannot be seen from the outside world. And in such a situation, you're free to change it without affecting somebody else. This concept works perfectly well when we think about microservices. And in fact, leads to one of those, the big ticket items of microservices, which is how we think about data. So here's an example of an accounts microservice. And in this situation, we've got these blue dots and these represent in-memory data structures or methods, low-level methods. And we see a data, the database associated with the accounts microservice. Now, if we allow an outside party to directly reach into our internal implementation detail, directly accessing our tables and our database, directly accessing our methods or our in-memory data structures, it becomes very difficult for us as somebody who's the maintainer of the accounts microservice to be clear about what changes are safe to make. Can I rename a method in this situation? Can I add a new database constraint? Could I change a column name? And the answer is, I'm not sure. Now, when we're as developers, we want to be productive, we want to make changes, and we don't want to break stuff. In an environment where you don't have information hiding, and you've got an external party we could be reaching into any of your internal implementation detail, you can often find that you're paralyzed by fear. And that's a real problem. In this situation here, a simple innocent change may well end up breaking an upstream consumer, which could in turn, of course, really result in, say, a production outage. What we want to do instead is sort of by default say, well, nothing is, nothing is exposed. We only expose what is the bare minimum. And we sort of clearly, you know, we want to think, you know, expose only what you have to. And instead you want to think outside in, what is it that people actually need? So think not what, oh, here's what I've got in my database. Let's stick that on an API. No, no, no. Think what does the consumers actually need and work out the API outside in. And that is one way to actually guarantee that this API is going to be as simple and as clean as possible. A lot of information hiding is not just about hiding things so they can change. It's also about being explicit about what is shared. So in this situation here, anything that's inside this sort of green hidden box can be changed freely. As a developer, I should have confidence that I can make whatever changes I like inside that boundary. And if I make a change, I change how my data is structured, I rework some code, it's not visible to the outside and therefore it won't break an external consumer. And so I might be more relaxed and maybe more aggressive in the changes I make in that area. But any changes I make in this shared world, effectively, this is where the, the sort of functionality is exposed via service interfaces to external parties. If I'm very explicit about this is the world which is potentially more dangerous to change, as a developer, if I know this is the part of the code that relates to my external interface, and that's really clear to me as a developer, then I'm going to be much more careful around the changes I make. I might do things, for example, like have increased uh, test coverage in this area to make sure I don't break uh, external uh, consumers. By being explicit to the developer working on the accounts microservice, we also end up being explicit to the consumer. This is the interface. This is what we have to maintain to deliver independent deployability for our consumers. But the shipping microservice also now knows, okay, that's what I can expect to get. So being explicit, information hiding is about being explicit about what is shared and what is hidden. And that explicitness is useful for both parties. This is why we hide databases. Hiding databases is about making, is about information hiding. Information hiding is about independent deployability when you get down to it. Now, we do have situations, of course, where we accidentally break things and these happen. So here's an example, a little snippet of code here. And uh, a very common thing for people to do would be to take a Java object like this and just map it into something like a JSON data structure. Um, it's not a particularly hard thing to do. JSON's not the best payload in the world, let's be clear. It's a pretty poor choice, I think. Is a, if you're, It's great for browsers, but it's not great for interstate process communication. But what the heck? Let's imagine you're doing it, because you probably are. We take a, you know, an object. We walk the fields, we map those into a JSON blob, and then we send that out over a network. And a lot of times you'll just use a, a, a library that is automatically for you. Now, as a developer, I start looking at this code and I think, well, hang on a minute. We are, we're storing the age of a customer here as an integer. And that seems a bit weird, right? And, but we see it gets mapped through to the external payload. 
But as a developer, I'm thinking, well, that seems silly, right? Because I might read that out of a database and then the date changes, we roll over into the next day, but I'm still holding the date, the age rather of that person, but they, it might have been their birthday. So maybe they might be now a year older. So that age could be out of date. It makes more sense for me to actually store that internal information in terms of having a date of birth and then maybe having a get age method which calculates the current age based on the current date against that date of birth so that would make sense for an internal change but if i'm automatically taking that data structure and mapping it to a json payload that's going to cause a problem because i've removed the age field and so it's not going to be in the json payload so this would be a backwards incompatible change and would result potentially in a breakage if any of the consumers need that field. What I want to do instead here would be to sort of do some sort of mapping so that I could explicitly say, well, actually, uh, okay, so a lot of this again is about being explicit. If you looked at this as a developer, would you know that this is magically being mapped into an external data type? Well, maybe not. And if you did know that, then you'd be able to say, okay, well, we do need to change how, the, how we kind of store that date of birth, but I still need now need a way to still create an age for our external consumers. This sort of changes and the fact that you've potentially broken somebody is, is kind of, it's a bit hard to see that this has happened unless you have tests around it. An alternative is to actually have an explicit contract. I love explicit contracts. What I want is for the, you know, the, the microservice exposes an endpoint to say, this is what I expose in a way that I can then do some comparisons with. Right. This, by having an explicit contract and explicit schema, it's much easier for us to actually check schema compatibility. So I really like this as an approach. If you're using JSON, you could make use something like JSON schema. So if you expose a JSON payload, you say, this is the schema that I expose. When you then make a change to that JSON schema, there are programs you can run that will compare two different versions of a JSON schema and tell you if the new one is backwards compatible or not with the old. You can do the same thing with uh, protocol buffers, which is the serialization format used as part of gRPC. So you could put this in your build. When you go to check in your code, it will compare the new schema version with the old, and it could fail the build if your new schema version is not backwards compatible. This is sort of, for me, a little bit like um, almost like compile time checking with statically typed languages. It doesn't replace the need for tests, but it limits where I have to now use tests. Because if I've got my schema compatibility checking, picking up simple problems like you've missed a field, then I can focus my energy on writing tests for semantic breakages. So you've also got similar things. You've got like the, you know, the, the, the schema registry that you get if you're using uh, Kafka. If you're using the open API specification, you can make use of the open API diff program that does this for REST-based interfaces. So all of this stuff can be very useful in terms of catching these breaking changes before they ever get to production. Testing is of course still needed, right? So if the contracts, the structure of the contract doesn't change, but the behavior does, you still need tests to catch that. So information hiding makes it more explicit when we make changes that might be backwards compatible or not. It actually reduces the scope of changes that could potentially break an external consumer. The simplest way to adopt information hiding is to not expose anything at all whatsoever unless someone explicitly asks for it. And that's gonna be the safest way forward for you. That keeps your interface small, makes backwards compatibility easier, and it'll make it easier for you to deliver on independent deployability. And as part of information hiding, if you use explicit schemas, your life will be much easier in catching accidental breakages before they occur. Now, there are other ideas that from the 1960s and 1970s we can look at, and namely these are the things that come from structured programming, and probably the two terms that you've probably heard in many different contexts before, the terms coupling and cohesion. And these are typically, these were terms that were originally defined in terms of how we think about code and sort of how we organize a single code base. But we can apply these concepts in the context of a services architecture. When we think about coupling and code, we always talk about the degree to which we want these things. We talk about wanting a low degree of coupling and strong or a high degree of cohesion. The concept of cohesion, at least from a services point of view, I think is fairly straightforward. It's not necessarily as easy to define maybe some of the code level definitions for this topic, but you know, I think about cohesion as the code that changes together stays together. So if I'm, you know, I don't really wanna to have to go into 15 different places to change how invoicing is done. I wanna to to go and change invoicing in one place. So my code is highly cohesive. I think if you're avoiding the need to change lots of different things, that's kind of 
conceptually how I grasp the idea. And this kind of speaks to why we don't like weak cohesion. So here I've got a services architecture, but the functionality for my system is spread across all of these layers of the system such that I'm constantly having to make changes across multiple layers. So if this is something that's going on in your architecture, you probably have a weak cohesion. And in that context, you probably end up with all kinds of nasty coupling issues which we'll get to in a minute. Coupling is a degree to which changing one thing requires a change in another. So if you think about it, it's modules or microservices. So if things are tightly coupled, changing one thing requires me to have to change the other thing as well. Now, it turns out that these concepts of coupling and cohesion are actually linked. The thing called Constantine's Law, which was named after Larry Constantine, which basically says that a structure is stable. And we want stable structures, remember, because we want those stable interfaces. A structure is stable if cohesion is strong and coupling is low. And this sort of makes sense from a common sense point of view. If cohesion is low, therefore my code is spread across different layers of my architecture, for example. When I make a change, I'm often going to have to change those, end, those, those sort of different parts together. So that's an example of weak cohesion, but now it's also strong coupling as well, because I'm having to change lots of things together. If you've built a distributed system, and layered architectures often fit the bill here. If you've got a distributed system and you're constantly finding yourself having to make change to multiple microservices at once and perform like lockstep deployments, it's, the chances are you've got weak cohesion and tight coupling. You have what is called a distributed monolith and your life is probably painful. When it comes to coupling, there's, there's different types of coupling that you encounter. Microservices sort of have this interesting paradox because in the one hand sense, we want microservice architectures for their independent deployability. But on the other hand, microservices don't really exist by themselves. If you have one microservice, you don't really have a microservice system. You have a, you know, a standalone application. Microservices kind of collaborate with one another. They work together to make something happen. So microservices have to talk to each other. So there is some degree of coupling that is unavoidable. So we can look at the different types of coupling that you'll encounter and look at them. Are they good? Are they bad? What does this mean? So we start off with domain coupling, which is the weakest form of coupling that we'll see. This is talks about normal service service interaction. We'll then look at common coupling. And finally, we look at content coupling. And we'll see how, as we go from the left to the right, these types of coupling become worse. So when working on a system, when trying to improve a system, what we're going to try and do is try and take the type forms of coupling and make them looser, if you want, to get the independent deployability that we would like. So. Let's start with domain coupling. Domain coupling is what occurs when one microservice is talking to another. Effectively here, we're talking about coupling to what would be called the domain protocol if we're thinking with our rest hats on. So in this example here, I've got something called an order processor. And the order processor needs as part of its operations to reserve stock, but it doesn't manage stock. The warehouse manages stock. So in this situation, the order processor is asking the warehouse to please, can you reserve some stock for me? Likewise, it's going to the payment service and saying, please, can you take payment? In this situation, we have domain coupling. This order processor has a degree of coupling to both the warehouse and the payment microservice. If we change how this, how say the warehouse protocol works, then that will cause a change in this interaction. Likewise, if we change say the payment um, domain protocol, that will change this interaction. Now there is no communication or coordination between the warehouse and the payment microservice. So a change here, so a change to the warehouse domain wouldn't impact payment. Domain coupling is kind of the weakest form of coupling that we kind of will see in a microservice architecture apart from there being zero. And it's sort of some degree of this is acceptable. We'll still try and reduce it though. When you see one microservice that is has domain coupling to lots of downstream microservices. That's a microservice that could be more vulnerable to any domain protocol changing. So also sometimes it's sign it's doing too many things. So again, the weaker form of coupling. So let's look at maybe kind of a middling form of coupling that you might see in service architecture. And this is what's called common coupling. And this is a situation where you've got multiple microservices, which are all dependent on an externally defined, say data source. A good example might be an in-memory cache. So here we've got the warehouse microservice, which is managing and recording stock levels, say held in an in-memory Redis cache. Uh, just doesn't have to be Redis, could be any kind of in-memory sort of data structure. And the order processor reads stock levels from this and the forecasting microservice reads 
their stock levels from that situation. The problem we've got here is this is kind of just an arbitrary data, shared data structure effectively. Any change to that data structure is potentially gonna have kind of a nasty ripple effect. So, you know, this is not great. There are some situations where it's acceptable. Good examples would be things like um, static reference data. So I need a list of, I don't know, all the countries of the world and the capitals of those countries. And it's a very static a bit of data, it doesn't change very often. And fundamentally the structure of this data doesn't change too much. With things like common coupling, this gets worse as this data structure becomes more complicated. The simpler this data structure is, the easier common coupling is to deal with. Um, so just that's something to be aware of. We try and avoid, so if you think about the difference between something as simple as a stock level, which I might, which might just be you know, the ID of an item and the number of items that we've got in stock, that's a very, very simple data structure to maintain. And it's not gonna change that much. Compare this to maybe a giant shared database, which has a very rich schema structure. There's a, the richer the schema structure, the more chances there are that you're gonna to have to change some part of it. Let's look at now the worst form of coupling that we might encounter. This is what's called content coupling. And these terms are kind of a bit weird because this is the, the kind of the original terms for these types of coupling. So here I've got an order microservice that manages the life cycle of a given order. And so its, it's job is to look after sort of how a, the piece of data around an order changes amongst other things. And we have a well-behaved order processor that as part of its operations, every now and then needs to um, ask to the order microservice to make changes to the order. So it might say, okay, hello order, can you please move the um, order from state placed to state um, picking? And the order microservice says, okay, we're well, gonna look at the state of that order. Oh, well, it's, currently, it's currently in state placed and you wanna go to picking? Well, that's an allowable state transition. So yes, based on my logic, effectively thinking about it's like a state machine. Now, based on my logic and what I think should be done, that request that you've made of me makes perfect sense. And so I'm gonna allow that to happen. This is why I like the term request rather than command, by the way. Microservices get to say no if you're asking it to do something which violates its local logic, right? So this is, this is all going well, we're doing fine. Our coupling at this point between the order processor and that order microservice is that, that sort of degree, that um, domain coupling we talked about earlier. So the world's a fairly happy place at this point in time. As long as I maintain the interface here, and I, don't, don't, I can make whatever change I like inside here, as long as I maintain this compatibility with that interface, I'm gonna be all right. But along comes the bad behaved warehouse microservice. Like this is the badly behaved, you know, we, we didn't, it's not, it wasn't, you know, wasn't looked after at school, right? It's been hanging out with the rough microservices behind the bike sheds, it doesn't play by any rules. And it's decided to bypass information hiding and just directly manipulate the data for an order. And so maybe the warehouse does things like, well, you know, we, I, it might reach into the, the, the sort of the internals of our database and say, well, I'm just going to change the state of this order and I'm going to move it from state uh, place to state shipped. And because I've got direct database access, I can do this. So we've obviously completely bypassed information hiding at this point. We've got this situation now that as a maintainer of the order microservice, it's very difficult for me to know what I can change because a simple change here or here might now end up breaking the warehouse microservice because the relationship between what I do and what the warehouse microservice needs is entirely implicit. So that's a real problem. There's another issue here though that's a bit more fundamental. When you see this going on, it nearly always is an example of low cohesion and often co-duplication. Because I've got logic inside the order microservice that defines the allowable state transitions on these bits of data. But the warehouse is also reaching into that database and also making those changes happen. Therefore, I've got to have duplication of that logic up here as well. So I've got logic here in warehouse about how an order is allowed to change. I've also got logic in here around how an order is allowed to change. So I've got duplicated logic and is that logic behaving in the same way? Are they written by the same people? When you get situations like this, you've got lots of different microservices all reaching into the same database. Aside from all the implications of the fact we bypassed information hiding and it's kind of hard to make changes to this thing now, we have a more fundamental problem, which is, is data being changed in a and the answer is, well, we don't know. We might have one thing think it can change data in one way and another in a different way. There's a reason why we call this form of coupling pathological coupling. Not great. 
what we'd ideally like to do is to say, well, warehouse, just don't try and directly make these changes. Go and ask the order microservice to do it for you. Move effectively from content coupling, pull that form of coupling more to the left, make it more like domain coupling. It's a looser form of coupling, much easier to work with. So when you see different forms of coupling in a microservice architecture, think, well, can I take this form of coupling that I'm seeing and somehow move it further up, move it, shift it left, where I'm decreasing the degree of coupling I'm, I'm having. Constantine's law shows us that by doing this and by decreasing our coupling, we'll actually also improve the cohesion of our system as well. That will kind of sort of come along for the ride. So in summary, information hiding is vital for microservices. Some forms of coupling is a lot worse than others. So uh, in those situations, if you can replace a tight form of coupling with a looser form of coupling, you'll be better off. Uh, but fundamentally, if you follow the, kind of the rules of information hiding, think about low coupling, and think about strong or high cohesion, you'll end up making independent deployability much easier to deliver. Now, I think we've got plenty of time for questions, but if you want to know more about the work I do, you can find information over at samnewman.io. Um, but I thought, yeah, let's, let's throw it open to questions. Sam, thank you so much. Um, a lot of uh, information that, to me, I, I didn't even hear about these couplings, so new information for me. I, I just knew coupling. I just, uh, I didn't know there are forms of coupling. I did oh, yeah, study. There's, there's a lot. I went through a lot of books look, reading, look, written in the 1960s and 1970s, and there's lots of different schemes, lots of different types of coupling. So those are just the, the sort of three that I've come up with that kind of map to services. Not all forms of coupling, that, lots of forms of coupling make a lot of sense at a code level. They don't necessarily translate to service-based interactions, though. So that's why I've kind of tried to distill it down to those three. Right, right. Well, when I was in uni, I, all I studied is uh, don't uh, do low coupling and high cohesion. And then goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Go on your journey and figure out how to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, and, and you've just described ways to th th think about it, step back. I think, to me, it's really, uh, do you think it has something to do with domain-driven design um, or it's a different thing? Well, no, no, I don't think it's a different thing. I think if you look at domain-driven design, if you look at something like the bounded context in domain-driven design, the bounded context is an example of information hiding. Whether or not that's explicitly, like in the original Eric, book by Eric Evans, Eric talks about a bounded context like a cell in biology. And with a cell, you have a biological wall that hides things from the outside world. The bounded context as a concept is about information hiding. And that's the building block of our domain. You have explicit responsibilities inside a bounded context that are hidden. You have a local context and you can change that local context inside the bounded context without having to change the rest of your domain. So I'd say fundamentally, whether it was explicitly called out or not, or was it whether or not it was an explicit driver of what Eric was doing or not, for me, the bounded context is a way of coming up with, you know, an information hiding boundary right. for domains. Right, right, right. Um, we got two really nice questions from Istvan. Uh, first one, interface, uh, yeah, interface of module and contract between modules are key for backward compatibility. But what about internal changes that alters the module behavior perceptible from outside? Yeah, so I think uh, this is a smaller version. I do, I do like a much longer version of this talk where I talk about the difference between semantic breakage and structural breakage. So if you think about a structural breakage, that would be where I exposed a method and that method took two integers. And then I, I changed that method and I now remove one of those integers. So now my method only takes one integer. That would be an example where the, the sort of the data or the structure of my schema has changed in a very obvious backwards incompatible way. And schemas can really help you see that change very clearly. But imagine a semantic, a behavioral change. So your method takes two integers. And when I call that method with, and I give you those two integers, you add those two numbers together and return the result. And that's version one. And in version two, I give you those two integers and now you multiply them together and return the result. The structure of the schema looks exactly the same, but the behavior is different. Right. So when you're thinking about breakages, it is useful to think separately about those. Structural breakages, if you use an explicit schema, are really easy to catch. Semantic breakages, though, are something you're going to need to write tests for. And this is where I'd use things like consumer-driven contracts to pick up those problems. 
I see. So you can't really formulate everything in, in the interface. You have to have tests as well besides the interface definition. Well, this, the, the analogy sort of I draw here is if you think about a statically typed versus dynamic typed languages. With a statically typed languages, the compiler catches a lot of the kind of programming errors you might make. It won't compile because I'm calling a method that doesn't really exist. Right. Um, and then that means that my testing work with a statically typed language can be more focused on checking the behavior of the software. Right. Right, right, with right. dynamically typed languages, though, because the types aren't fixed until runtime, it's easier for those mistakes to kind of leak through. And so some of our tests effectively end up catching those typing issues. Right. I'm not saying I love dynamically typed languages. I use dynamically typed languages a lot inside microservice boundaries. Personally, though, I feel that at the service level, it makes sense to put the work into having explicit schemas just to catch the easy stuff, make the easy stuff easy. And then we can focus our brain power on the really important hard stuff, which is the semantic compatibility checking. Right. Um, again, a lot of questions. I will go with, uh, I will read this second question of, of Istvan. Um, but before I will ask uh, Iowan's question, you've mentioned that you would avoid JSON for interface communication. Why is that? And what would you recommend instead of it? So, so firstly, I say that because I want to make sure people are paying attention. Uh, because it's always useful because some people get really annoyed when I say that JSON is rubbish. I mean, JSON is rubbish, but it does make sure people are paying attention. But partly because it's not that, you know, what's it good for really? Oh, oh it's human readable. What, what do we care? If we're sending something from one computer to another, what have human readability got to do with it? For, for, a you know, for a text file, sure, do whatever you want. It's not that much smaller than XML. XML has some significant benefits. There's a lot of uh, implementations around XML parsers are still significantly faster than their JSON implementations. Um, so for me, it's like, it's just, it's something we've sort of ended up with. It's fine for browsers, but if you're looking at, say, efficient communication between services, if you're looking at serialization formats, I mean, you have to look, obviously look at your, your, the programming problem you're trying to solve. But protocol buffers, for example, are mm -hmm. significantly faster to write, right. faster to send, and faster to read. And there are lots of other serialization formats out I there. I keep saying proto buffs to everyone, but no one listens to me so far. So, <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah. yeah. Um, next, OK, next question um, from Istvan. What transaction pattern would you recommend when more services are involved in atomic operations? Yeah, well, you, you don't do transactions. So um, if you think about the transactions you're thinking of, you're thinking of transactions in terms of probably a database transactions. So you're thinking about, you know, atomicity of operation. You don't, when you move to a distributed system, I strongly, 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 strongly recommend you start trying to give up this idea of atomic state change. There are some programming problems where you absolutely have to do it, but they should be in the minority. Fundamentally, if you're trying to do atomic state changes across multiple microservices, you'll end up being in the world of basically coordination of distributed locks. Um, so don't do those things. Typically, what people are trying to do with these situations is effectively model a business process. And in which case, model a business process. Don't try and just use some kind of distributed transaction to fix this problem. It's not going to fix the problem in the way you expect. Um, have a look at these things called sagas instead. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so sagas give you a way of explicitly modeling operations that could span multiple different transactions. You can still have transactionality, but you don't have transactionality across the whole operation. You have it across different bits of the operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sagas are the things you look at. Um, I write them up in chapter four, I think, of Monitor to Microservices. There's a whole chapter on this stuff in the new building microservices version. Chris Richardson covers, I think he has a whole chapter on sagas in his microservice patterns book. And there is a great talk by Katie McCaffrey, um, who you should always watch because she's awesome. Uh, but she does a really nice talk about sagas. I think she, you can find it online. Um, her talk about sagas focused on what we call an orchestrated saga. There's also these things called choreographed sagas. And I think Chris talked about the distinction in his book. I've heard about sagas, but uh, in a different context, in Redux, uh, but I think it's quite similar because sagas define like a process. But you've just mentioned a lot of like sources. Uh, do you have a website where we can go and we can have this? Uh, I think the, the presentations will be available in some way or another. Yeah, yeah. But the, 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 uh, I've got there are slides available online. Uh, I mean, you can find on my website, samnewman.io, there's links to all my books there. So. Monolith to microservices, you can go and read at O'Reilly.com. You can get a free trial at O'Reilly.com, like a seven day free trial or a 30 day free trial. And you can read the whole book without paying me any money. Um, but I have a mortgage. So 
if you can buy a copy, that would be great. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, but yeah, it, it, I will um, pop a note in and hop in with those references a bit yeah, later yeah. on, just so everyone's got. Please do, yeah, yeah. Um, one more question or two more questions uh, from Razvan. If the warehouse service only reads data, is that acceptable? It's uh, reading, only reading the internal data of microservice is a little bit better than writing. So it still, though, has the problems of coupling. So I still have that fundamental issue that I change that database structure, I break the external consumer. So if you're reading or writing, that doesn't change. It potentially lessens the concerns about duplication of, say, state transition. So in a situation where both of those things are writing, I've got logic about how state is allowed to transition in two places. If I'm not writing, that kind of goes away. But there's still other issues around duplication of logic and potentially inconsistency in terms of how that data is viewed. So it's better, it's still not great. And you're still fundamentally not hiding. Um, I think there are, there are sort of, um, it's, if you read only is better than read write, uh, even better would be to say, well, could I define a database view that only allows me to see a small subset of that online data? And that's another technique you can use to sort of reduce that kind of reliance mm -hmm. on the underlying um, schema. Sam, we've got um, really nice questions here. Um, I, I would suggest you should answer them, definitely. I will read one more. And yep. please check out the Q&A tab after. Um, um, anonymous asks, if the warehouse and order services were maintained by the same team, would that be acceptable or still bad? Um, it, it lessens the impact. So, the, it, you know, ultimately what you're saying here is I've got two services, they're both reading and writing from the same database. That causes these things to be coupled. So I may be in the world of having to do lockstep deployments when I make a breaking change, blah, blah, blah. If you have to do things like lockstep deployments and deal with tightly coupled components, it is easier to deal with those within an organizational boundary, like a team structure, right? So the team of five of us, we can kind of manage that. But the first thing I'll say about that is you're still going to have the issue of when I make a change, I may well have to deploy the whole lot together. So there's potentially a bigger impact on the production system. The scope of the deployments are still going to be larger. There's more things that can go wrong. And I'd also say that ownership structures inside organizations aren't static. Right. What happens when you spin up a new team is now going to own the order management. Right. So yeah. it's better, but it's not great. Um, a lot of great questions. I'm going to ask questions from, I have a question and... Uh, well, you, you've got the microphone. So yeah, exactly. If you want to ask, be an MC. There you go. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> so my question, what kind of technologies, because I'm more practical, what kinds of uh, tools actually or frameworks uh, do you use? Do you prefer, um, f we've, I've mentioned Protobuf, do you use it? And what kind of backend services like do you prefer? I know this is a very bad question, but... Still. Uh, uh, I, to, mm, I use what I know well, so I tend to gravitate towards Java and the JVM and Python um, and Ruby because I know those languages the best and the runtimes the best. Um, it's rare that you know when you work with a team you get a choice because often you work with what people. Right. And, and, and in terms of you know what supporting services I might use, I use anything that someone else that's smarter than me can run for me. So I love managing managed services. If I, if I can use a public cloud, I tend to be pretty happy because I can offload as much work to somebody else. Right. So I'm not going to start with Kubernetes, right? My starting point would probably be something much simpler. I might use like Beanstalk or I might use, um, you know, uh, uh, Lambda, for example. And here's another thing that people will be surprised. I won't start with microservices. I always start, I would start my default starting choice. Unless I know explicitly there's some reason why I wouldn't, yeah. I start monolith first. Right, exactly. And let's not even talk about lambdas because that's a whole different yeah. part. Well, you've got Adrian coming up later, I think, talking about, um, about serverless. So you'll, you'll all have right. all kinds of uh, stuff. All right, there. Sam, thank you so much. Uh, I was